So again, hi, everybody. Welcome to the very first talk in our AI series where we explore how artificial intelligence intersects with multiple fields. Uh, I'm Bryce York. I am your host, and I'm super excited to kick this off. Uh, kick this off with a bang. So today we're diving into a topic uh, on everybody's radar, uh, especially with AI, say like AI and fraud detection, uh, revolutionizing risk management in a fin in fintech. Um, so we've got an incredible lineup of experts, as you can see on the panel here, um, that I'm really excited to start kind of digging into some very uh, very pointed questions for them, and. and uh, and they'll be able to share us their insights and their expertise and what they've experienced throughout the uh, throughout fintech and even in with AI um, and especially with ethical considerations for for AI. So, uh, but before we get into that part of it, I want to start introducing everybody here. So we do have a, a panel of uh, great people here. We have four experts uh, joining me. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and start introducing them. Uh, first off, we have Aaron Goltz Goldsman. Uh, he is the pr head of product over at Deal. So, uh, Aaron, can you kind of give us a little quick synopsis of your background? Uh, sure. So I um, head product Deal, which is a global HR company, which might not be a st obvious choice for uh, a fintech, uh, fin crime thing. But we process billions of dollars of payments across yeah. 140 countries on an annual basis. Um, prior to this, I was at a Twilio where I looked after sort of actually their identity and account security product offerings. So it was for third party. And then I was head of product for two fintechs. One is a global nonprofit called Kiva that did microfinance. And the other was um, uh, Prosper, which was a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform. Awesome. Yeah, you definitely have your experience in that end. <laughs> Absolutely. So, and then uh, secondly, we have Mohammed Top Uwila. He is a senior data scientist uh, for fraud prevention at WISE. Hi. Uh, so uh, I've been at WISE for around four years. And for those of you who don't know what WISE is, so WISE is a global technology company building the best way to move and manage the world's money. Um, and pretty much WISE has 16 million people, 16 million people and businesses use WISE. And in the fiscal year of 2023, WISE uh, processed approximately 105 billion in cross-border transactions, uh, which is really cool. Uh, but a little bit more about me, essentially, um, I, I have my, uh, I completed my graduation in information technology. And post that, I worked as a software engineer before doing my master's in business analytics and data science. And then jumping into this beautiful, beautiful field of data science, where I first worked in uh, different insurance uh, fraud detection, uh, specialized in uh, phone uh, damage protection insurance, and then finally moved on to this amazing field at Wise. Nice, nice, pretty eclectic background. That's awesome. Um, and then we have Ryan Stevens. He's a he's a senior data science manager at Ramp. Welcome to the welcome to the panel, Ryan. Uh, thanks, Bryce. Yeah, so I'm Ryan. Uh, I lead uh, the risk management team at Ramp. And for those that don't know, uh, Ramp is a expense management platform uh, for businesses. We serve over fifteen thousand businesses uh, located in the United States. Our mantra is we save our businesses time and money. Uh, and as part of that, uh, we have to manage our risk effectively. So I lead a team of applied scientists. Um, and analytics engineers that's responsible for all the algorithms, ML models, and data products that power risk management uh, at RAMP. Uh, I came to RAMP as an applied scientist prior to that. I was at Meta uh, working in ad tech um, on privacy work streams, um, and I entered data science via an economics PhD uh, that I attained from New York University uh, um, a few years back. Nice. Awesome. Well, cool. thank you. And Adiba Khan, she is a senior analyst at Klarna. Hi, everyone. Um, actually changed competence to product delivery lead, uh, but my background has been in uh, uh, analytics for the past uh, five plus years. Um, I work at a company called uh, Klarna, uh, providing uh, many, many merchants uh, their checkout solutions, payment options, um and uh, have worked specifically within fraud majority of my uh, career 
um, started out with more uh, analytical fraud, uh, worked in supporting uh, data science teams. My expertise is more on like the data parts and uh, uh, not so much in actual data science, although uh, my educational background comes from there. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. So thanks, that, thanks everybody, uh, for giving us uh, kind of a brief background in your companies as well as yourselves. And, you know, some of the uh, resonating things, like we're talking about billions of dollars of transactions. And then if we summarize all of your uh, companies together, I mean, that's a lot of, of uh, transactions that are happening. And especially when you start bringing that into the AI space, you know, there's a lot of fraud and a lot of opportunities for that to step in. So it's definitely on the top of everybody's mind um, uh, in this space. So uh, without holding the suspense any longer, let's get into the nitty gritty of these questions and how AI is transforming the FinTech landscape. So, all right, so you guys ready? I'm ready, I'm excited. So cool. All right, so um, how are cutting edge AI technologies transforming traditional fraud detection methods in the fintech industry so like how can you you know are you able to provide any examples on specific innovation that's that's had a notable impact you know and i'm you know i was wondering what aaron what your thoughts are on that um sure and so there's been i think a long history of like ml boosting across models for a long time and it's introduced all the things like disparate impact and whatnot um one of the things that i've uh personally seen which is been uh really powerful is allowing us to sort of <clears throat> segment our you know, our users um, and really kind of like the same way you would with a marketing flow, right, around risk. And so mm -hmm. all of those interactions that would be, you know, sort of spread out across everybody that would have been like pretty, pretty frictionful are now really focused on higher risk folks that are all sort of done, done with AI versus, and it's really not only just um, reduced fraud, it's actually helped conversion. Because you can really apply the scrutiny only in cases where it's really risky and everyone else kind of gets a, a pretty clear pass through. Yeah, that's incredibly interesting. Um, yeah, so you're not having to, like, with fraud prevention, you know, you have to be right all the time, right? Right. And, and, the, and the person mm -hmm. committing fraud just has to do it once, right? It has to be right one time. So you guys got to be ahead of the curve. You got to be ahead of the game, ahead of everything. So being able to use AI to really kind of, I guess, I don't know, forecast that, if you will, based on obviously algorithms or the, the data and, and all the ML that's in there, um, definitely will help you hone in on the profiles to really kind of target. And it, it's, like the, it's like going to the airport and having pre and clear versus having to go through the red girl line. Exactly. Exactly. Also, anybody else have any any input or insights onto that? Anything to add? Yeah, yeah I'm I'm happy to uh, kind of provide you know more more recent uh, innovations that that I'm sure are you know in the headlines a lot. But one thing um, uh, with sort of you know the LLM large language models um, kind of starting to enter new product spaces is the ability to take unstructured text, um, and there is a lot um, in uh, certainly the transaction space, uh, which is one vector of fraud that we deal with, um, and structure that um, to be able to normalize fields, um, i.e. to be able to parse out things uh, that are both more interpretable, but also easier to use uh, for features for a lot of the ML techniques um, that Aaron uh, kind of was mentioning for better segmentation. Uh, that's kind of been a recent innovation that's been uh, extremely important um, and efficient in both generation, but also kind of interpretability for operations folks that need to better understand, you know, what was this transaction? What was it for? What is the disparate pieces of information that were provided? Um, to kind of dig in to provide insight um, when a customer reaches out about a fraud event or yeah. we're tackling a fraud. Awesome. Yeah, that's interesting. Structuring the unstructured data with LLM. That's, yeah. So that way you can actually leverage it. Yeah, 100%. I uh, fully agree with Brian there because from uh, my experience, the 
the, the biggest challenges uh, we face are uh, data quality. Um, mm. Like having good data allows you to do a lot more, uh, but it's also very difficult depending on obviously the size of the company and the, and usually you have so much data that like having quality data or being able to create quality data is uh, is very difficult. Um, I haven't personally, like thinking of innovations, I haven't had the chance to fully explore this properly, but um, uh, at one point in my previous company, uh, we were looking at graph analytics and I love the idea of how it um, can help you see relations between data uh, in a way that uh, you don't usually maybe do by yourself in a like a re relational database. Um, so that's also very interesting. That uh, and I know that a lot of companies have successfully been able to use that for fraud detection. Nice, nice. Um, another innovation has which has had quite a big transformative impact is actually the application of um, generative adversarial networks in the detection of uh, handwritten check fraud um, and, and it's actually quite mind-blowing for me so researchers essentially used uh, GANs in order to um, to in order to detect uh, check fraud and they were able to reduce the false positives by 90 percent and uh, this completely Mind. I tried to sort of as the generative adversarial network. And just example I up with is uh, there's a chef who's trying to uh, cook vegan meat and trying to fool a critic into thinking uh, that they are eating actually uh, meat, but it's actually vegan. And it's basically two models one is generating and one is actually discriminating. So the chef is constantly generating different food items and the critic is uh, constantly discriminating whether it's actually vegan or not. <laughs> and this technique has actually already been quite useful. So I, so it's just uh, mind blowing how these techniques are being used to reduce uh, fraud. Yeah, that's, that's insane. Like handwritten checks is something that I wouldn't have even thought of, quite honestly. I mean, <laughs> who does that anymore? But again, that's probably another reason why it's probably really susceptible to fraud. It's because nobody's really checking it, right? Nobody's really using it, so nobody's really checking it. That's interesting. I guess I'd be interested to see how AI can maybe um, predict fraud, right? Go on the on the predictive side of it, of a lot of the behaviors, a lot of the different regions, or gathering the the large data models and try to model that out and say, okay, well, this is going to be the next evolution, or this is going to happen, or this based on these habits or these signals, fraud is going to happen in this sector or this particular area or something along those lines. Uh, so we were at Klarna, we were looking at behavioral uh, analytics uh, or behavior yeah. data uh, with the, I mean, it's it's very, it's so much data that it's very difficult to sometimes uh, manage that internally. Uh, it has to be like people that are experts at this data points and then, mm -hmm. um, you know, help us guide. Uh, so we were looking at uh, external vendors that were doing this. Uh, I would s still s say that it's uh, like it's very difficult to do it well. Like in my experience, having seen amazing results so far. Um, and the other part is also that you have to um, to be able to detect on like behavior um, data, and the behavior data could be like how, the way you're like you're typing, the way you're clicking on something, or scrolling around a page. Yeah. Like that needs like you have to have some sort of sticky identifier that is telling you that, hey, this is the same customer returning and you have to have this returning behavior uh, yeah. over a time period to be able to say, oh, okay, this is the behavior this customer is supposed to have versus not have. Um, so it's it's super interesting, but very, very difficult to do in real life. Yeah, the amount of, of data, the amount of, of lines of data would be absolutely insane. And on top of that, it has to be good data. Right. So that kind of ties back into, you know, the LLM to, to make sure that the data is good, making sure that the um, unstructured data is structured. So you have everything. So and that's the interesting thing about AI is, is it all stems from the data and the quality of the data that, that the that the model is able to learn off of, which is interesting. 
Cool. So, um, going moving on. So, Adiba. So, what ethical considerations come into play when when utilizing AI for fraud detection? Um, there's so many, but um, I, I would say it's also uh, depending on the market. Like, there's different types of regulatory uh, requirements, and I just like from what I've understood very high level, like within just the U.S., like depending on which state you're in. Th those also vary quite a lot, um, mm -hmm. but um, 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 I mean, it's um, yeah. The the ethical considerations uh, could be anything from uh, basically uh, not uh, having a model that is biased uh, towards right. a specific gender or uh, yeah race and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, you can I run into like the profiling discussion as well, right? I mean, I think one of us had the um, example of going into an airport, right? You know, it's like you have that profiling aspect too. So if you have, you know, the like, how can you, yeah, how does ethics come into that? Because you have a model that's being trained off of what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. And it's like, I don't know about everyone else in this group, but like in my personal experience, I've seen that happen so many times where like uh, you start seeing how someone's built a model that can tend to be biased or a rule that is also indication of like being biased towards something. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, it's very difficult, but so easily done uh, that it's, uh, yeah, it kind of like breaches those like ethical. Uh, yeah. yeah. Does anybody have any other uh, thoughts on that? Actually, in the last question, um, Adiba mentioned that she was also trying to use uh, some of the behavioral data, right, uh, of mm -hmm. our customers. And actually, that could be contributed as uh, some really sensitive information about the customers. Um, and essentially, here you have the risk of uh, exposing this data or someone actually misusing this sensitive data in any particular way. That's a um, good point. And privacy breaches could just uh, make it quite uh, worse. So then <laughs> comes up the question, how do you actually uh, prevent something like this from happening? Uh, and I think over here, maybe thinking a little bit even ahead, uh, practices like maybe federated learning could come in where you don't actually need to get the data to any of your servers, but you actually just uh, take the data, train it on the customer's device, um, and then rather than sending the data, you send the model back maybe. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good way to, to kind of achieve that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, um, so one one kind of follow-up here is, is I think it really does depend on what actions you're taking. Certainly there's there's issues of data privacy, using the appropriate data to make a given decision. But you also have to think about the de given decisions you're making. Um, if it's very much a zero or one decision, a, a long-term consequence for a consumer. So, you know, mortgage markets accept or reject so much mortgage application. That's a very severe decision that requires different ethical considerations than maybe something along the lines of, hmm, can you provide some more details when you try to sign in to a specific page? And so I do think it's kind of important to distinguish that kind of the, the scrutiny you put on any given kind of data, on any model that you use, really does depend on the ultimate strategy and decision you're taking. And so just kind of got to be clear that not all strategies, not all decisions um, necessarily uh, require the same, uh, the, the same level of consideration when thinking through these decisions as well. And certainly I think, as has been mentioned, different markets, even within the US, different states. Certainly there are now some cities um, that may or may not have an opinion about what data mm -hmm. and what models can be used. Um, that's also like a, a, a large consideration for the bounding box of the decisions you make. I know that one way we're kind of tackling these issues are like if we see a fraud risk and this doesn't work in all the markets, but it works really well in a market like Sweden, where we have this thing called bank ID. It's a basically authentication method that identifies yeah. you.
but it's uh, I mean the success rate of it is close to like 99%. Uh, so whenever we see a risk, uh, instead of saying hey we reject your your uh, basically like your credit, uh, we instead try to get you to uh, identify yourself. So it's like we can balance um, that and actually say hey we don't reject the customer. We're not being um, using our biases to to make it more difficult for a certain group of people to maybe uh, use our uh, solutions. Uh, we are mm -hmm. actually giving them still a solution to identify them and still go ahead with the, the purchase. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, we're, we're talking about bias. There's also consumer privacy. Right, the piece of it, which is pretty pretty urgent. Uh, it's uh, but I hope it's incredibly uh, secure with the with the private data and everything like that. So, uh, how do you guys see that as a challenge with AI? So, I think there's the there's the training model issue, which is real and significant. But there's a lot mm -hmm. you can do to identify and anonymize. Um, <clears throat> I'm not like super up on all the regulations, but most of them do have carve outs for the purpose of fraud detection because there's a true consumer benefit. So from a regulatory perspective, you're like, okay. you have some room um, from an ethical perspective. That's a different question, right? Like, you know, I think kind of going back to the slightly to the previous question, but like that, that the model can be mathematically right, but can impact different populations inequitably and there's no way to back That's, that up and it's yeah it sucks and that is one of the fundamental problems that we're going to have like a you know the, the privacy segmenting data into the modeling and then you know solving for that real challenge our philosophy is you always need to put it like for anything and and even to the point which like yes the decision making point that was made was like really valid like if you're going to, you know, straight up decline someone, that's a real big thing versus that a little bit of extra scrutiny. But on the flip side to that, like, and I think that's a, a very fair approach. But if we think about what we do on sort of the growth side of like trying to get more customers through and trying to like reduce that friction, if you start to have that disparate impact of adding more friction, it can add up, which is mm -hmm, maybe mm -hmm. not an immediate problem today, but over time gets nasty. Um, you know, I think, our philosophy is that you always need to put a human in the middle is that no final decision can be made by an AI by itself, but it is a, now our businesses sort of allows for do that because it's a B2B kind of B2B to C thing versus a direct consumer. It makes it a little bit easier, but you know, I think it's a right now, I think we'd be concerned about doing that without human sort of oversight. Yeah. It's, it's a fantastic point, Aaron, uh, around the, it can be mathematically correct, but definitely, um, you know, have other ethical type of uh, errors in it, I guess, if you will, without that human human aspect of it. So, yeah, that's a good point. Um, so moving on, just kind of moving on from this one, I'm really interested in like the future, right? So, you know, Aaron, um, Aaron or Ryan, either one of you guys, uh, you know, what does the future hold for AI in fraud detection and risk management within the fintech sector? Like, where do you see this going from here out? <laughs> you want to take it, Aaron, first? Uh, I can I can chime in after. I, I, at the risk of being somewhat uh, trite about it, it's the movie War Games, right? It is the AI fighting the AI. The generative AI who's committing the fraud and the generative AI that's preventing the fraud. And at some point it's like, you know, the end sorry, I'm old. The end of this movie War Games <laughs> is that you stopped this AI that had a control of all the nukes by having it play tic-tac-toe against itself. So it became stalemate. Uh, the only way to win is not to play not to play is the internet meme. Uh, but at some point, you know, we're seeing the the bad guys evolve at the same pace, if not faster than we are. And so it's like, I, I think it's going to be very interesting to sort of not just see what's fraud, but how is, how is fraud being auto-generated? Okay. Yeah. I, I, I think there's, 
two things there that I can kind of expand on. I think one is real-time analytic solutions are becoming commoditized in a way that is allowing both for faster detection at firms, both it's both like the consumer and producer side of things. Like firms are able to detect these things faster. The producers, the fraudulent actors are able to produce new strategies at a quicker pace as well. Um, but I do think like a speeding up of data processing, a decrease in compute costs, a move to the cloud, which has been, I think, a thing for 30 years now, but it's actually, there's a lot more commodities on the cloud to do real-time analytics and real-time feature engineering and processing um, at a, at a speed that we've not, that hasn't existed outside of sort of the bigger, more um, legacy players that had the infrastructure investment to be able to build those things out. Um, and that actually is gonna fundamentally change the nature of doing fraud detection. Speed is both like a, a gift and a curse. Uh, right. It's a gift because you can respond faster. It's a curse because you can produce more high volumes quicker. Um, and so your observability of your alerting of the decisions you're making needs to be a lot more fine grained if you can make a thousand decisions in a minute versus if you can make one decision in a minute. Um, so, so that's thing one. I think thing two is, uh, I don't know if I see war games more like, uh, it, it's more, I see like cyborgs. So I see a lot better tooling for our operators. Um, so that's something I internally see. we see a, a lot of and we're investing more in is how do we provide operators and people responding to fraudulent events a how do we bootstrap them how do we leverage the data we have um, and some models we can to get them at a good starting point to say hey we think that the fraud is segmented to this space of things maybe these sets of companies maybe these sets of cards maybe these sets of features that we think are important for you in fact we're going to give you um, a set of rules to start off with um, that will bootstrap them. Uh, you plug that into kind of a real-time uh, analytics engine, they can iterate quickly, they can get fast results and they can kind of attack those things quicker. Um, I don't see humans like exiting the arena. I just see this like powering them up um, in a lot of different domains. Fraud is tough. It's humans responding quickly. It's smart players on the other side. Um, and so you always kind of need uh, someone that can think um, multidimensional at any given point in time um, uh, to kind of respond. Yeah. That's a great way to put it, though, right? I think both you guys are on on the same same playing field on this one where, you know, AI versus AI, there's always going to be machines battling the machines on this one, like it just will. But there's going to be human elements behind them or associated with them. So it's more of a, of a tooling and an enhancement, if you will, like a cyborg or, you know, the Iron Man suit or, or whatever, um, just enhancing the productivity of the people. Yeah, 100%. Awesome. Uh, Mohammed. so moving moving on to the next question here, what types of machine learning models are most effective in defecting or detecting productivities? Yeah, uh, what do you think? that's a great question, but actually there's no simple answer, honestly. <laughs> uh, I think it depends <laughs> for every use case, but most of the financial uh, institutes mostly have tabular data. And what we see is actually the best uh, model to use are basically boosting models, like for example, XG Boost. Um, and, and the reason why, why I say that is because with any financial institute, you you would require three things. One, some form of explainability uh, from the model. So essentially, if the model is saying something suspicious or there's a high probability, you want to know why it's saying that. You want to be able to highlight the features which are elevating the risk or uh, at the end of the day to be accountable. Uh, the second thing uh, I think is uh, a little bit with regards to um, overfitting. So essentially, you don't want your model to, um, uh, the, uh, sorry, you don't want your model to essentially uh, learn the learn the training data. So essentially, mug up uh, the fraud. But you rather want it to be generalized. You want it to be able to look at the generic patterns of fraud, and with XG Boost, essentially, you can prevent 
overfitting. And then finally, it's quite uh, easily tunable. So you essentially, you can tune the parameters quite easily to serve your purpose. So if you need to reduce uh, too many false alerts, you could do that. At the same time, if you need to catch more fraud at the cost of getting a few false alerts, it's possible to do that. Um, so again, <laughs> like uh, it, it's it seems like a good bet, but there are multiple other uh, models that you can actually use out there. So it's not easy. <laughs> it's what you're saying. Not at all. Like all the multiple different types of fraud that's out there, it just depends. There's not a one one model to fit it all. Not a one uh, area, of course. That's but that's probably that's 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 par for the course for for your industry in fraud detection, right? There's no way yeah. that one method is going to catch all fraud, right? And and I think yeah. uh, several of you have even mentioned that you know you have smart players on the other side of the fence as well that are trying to create that fraud. So you got to be one step ahead of that. Another thing that uh, we can always actually keep in mind is maybe having one model doesn't actually really make all the sense. Maybe you need a combination of models. So essentially, you can essentially evaluate your customer's device risk individually. You can uh, analyze any anomalous okay. behavior individually and then basically feed in these uh, risk scores into the final decision-making model, which essentially um, triggers the final alert saying, all right, this is good, this is bad. Uh, and we need to take an action on it. Yeah, one one thing to also highlight that's interesting about fraud um, is these are actors with heavy monetary incentives to try to generate new strategies to game mm -hmm. systems. And new strategies are new distributions of data. So your data generating process, i.e. the historical data that you've seen, um, may not and probably will not represent the given fraud event you might be experiencing or the future one. That's kind of the whole game that a fraudster is trying to play is that there's a new vulnerability that they're trying to attack. There's a new vector they found. And so in that world, sort of like supervised techniques, which boosting is, um, it uses historical data to fit on the past. Um, but if the distribution of the data you have, if the specific signals you're using change, uh, then those models can't pick them up quickly enough. So kind of as Mohammed said, there's other technique, unsupervised techniques are often at play to try to trigger alerts, um, ones where you don't need labels. Um, you find those, especially in rare instances, there are certain types of fraud that are very rare. You you see them very rarely, so you don't even have data collection. And there's different companies at different scales. Uh, your big banks of the world, you know, they've been in existence for a long time. They have millions, maybe even hundreds of millions of users. Um, that's like a different kind of problem you're solving. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so it's really kind of a unique space in the different types of models that you have to use here versus... Um, maybe other areas of ML that you might see in industry. Thanks. Something else that like adds to the complexity here is that usually within these like bigger companies uh, based, like having multiple different types of products and continuously developing their products, like the way someone uh, can interact with those products continuously changes as well. Uh, so I would say that's like the core thing that companies, I know that at least the companies I've worked with, they lack in, they develop products, they put them out there, but they don't test them properly. So sometimes it's not actually like smart fraud. Yeah. Majority of the fraud is actually pretty dumb fraud. It's just that no one's actually tested the products well enough. Uh, so they find these loopholes and then by the time they find them, like you, you understand the, the scale of the fraud and then you shut the do down that like loophole uh, by, by a product change. Yeah. So it's, it's finding the loopholes, preventing the dumb fraud, <laughs> and then staying ahead of the smart fraud. Got it. <laughs> Anybody else have anything to chime in on that? All right, cool. Well, I want to make sure that there is some some time available. We do have a, a 
pretty pretty sizable audience with us here today, and we do have a Q and A portion of it. Um, and so, just a reminder for everybody on the on the webinar, um, there is you know there is a section for Q and A. So go ahead and and go ahead and chime in. We do have a couple questions already populated in there, and we'll just go ahead and take this time and uh, you know have the panel answer your guys' specific questions. So uh, if you haven't done so yet, just go ahead and uh, start typing in on any of the Q&A and we'll go from there. So to get it kicked off, uh, Elshin has a, has a question here. Um, they were looking at uh, how AI affected is affecting uh, to, to mon money laundering prevention. So, you know, how is that, how is AI, how do you guys see AI really kind of helping prevent money laundering? Has any of any, anybody thought about yeah, that I one? Or is that one? I mean, <laughs> at the end of the day, money laundering has like a very specific input and output in order for it to work, right? There's a there's a very clear business income, right? Like you need to get money into a system and basically have it return trip to roughly the same set of folks, right? Um, and money laundering schemes get more and more sophisticated by making more hops, making more bounces, using different systems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That is a classic pattern matching problem and lookalike modeling problem. And if you know, because you you are solving for a very discrete in and out and being able to tie those together. So it's it's helpful. The problem is, is that sophisticated money laundering schemes jump between both entities and systems, right? <laughs> Money could go in through PayPal and out through Wise. You can't get the two systems to, to connect or... You know, this is classic and it's been, uh, you know, we saw this in sort of the some of the Middle Eastern conflicts is that most of that terrorist money would be like transferred via literally livestock between countries. It just totally pops off the map. And so, you know, you're yeah. still limited, but it's still a way better advantage than, you know, sort of, I would say like, or an asset in addition to, you know, forensic accounting and, you know, various sort of like government databases. So incredibly complex and hard to track with money laundering <laughs> because they, it can easily jump off the, the actual system and then you don't have any data to build off of. But so I think from system, what you... AI is super helpful. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, but it kind of it kind of reminds me of that smart versus dumb type of fraud, right? So some of it's just pattern recognition, like you said, which is it's right up AI's alley. I mean, that's just simple, like just... Uh, modeling against that but then it has the ability to jump off which is that smart <laughs> type of approach does anybody else want to take a stab at that one <laughs> i think that was a pretty comprehensive answer i think it was pretty good so um awesome so this one coming in uh from umang it's more of a, a specialized to the uh insurance industry specifically about you know what kind of ai tool can be deployed to detect the fraud in, in the insurance company or an in insurance industry, which I think is interesting. Somebody want to try to take a stab at that one? <laughs> it's actually, uh, a, 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 it's a little bit complex because the insurance is uh, these days of so many kinds, right? Uh, but again, insurance is a is a very complicated uh, place to be in terms of fraud prevention because mainly you need to be able to give a really explainable answer at the end of the day why you accept insurance or you deny insurance, and uh, that's where uh, we need to understand that if you're using more complicated AI solutions, you might not really be able to get that uh, straightforward answer. So I think in this case, it requires two things. One um, actually is just some really powerful analytics uh, along with some really simple out of the box, uh, sorry, uh, just some really simple white box algorithms. And these combined together actually um, could, could really help um, within the industry. And I know that doesn't actually uh, help answer, but maybe I need a little bit more context I think you 
you did allude into something that's pretty complicated, which is the the different types of insurances that are out there. And with AI, when we're talking about privacy, when we're talking about people's information um, and and ethics and ethical considerations around um, using AI, even in, in fraudulent you know claims or things of that nature, especially in the medical industry, can get very complicated. And and then the ethics uh, really starts coming into to question on that, right? Because you're dealing with people's health care, you're dealing with people's you know health uh, health situations. So you you know you have to use AI to try to uh, combat that that type of fraud, you know. And who's to say that they? I guess a common analogy would be you know whiplash in a car accident. Like that's the most common insurance fraud out there, most likely because it's very hard to detect. It's very hard to detect a whiplash when it comes into X rays or any other type of uh, anything like a, you know any medical examiner can do. But the insurance companies are still liable for it, right? So like, how do you use AI? To prevent that, right? So it's it's very complex, and I think it's I think it basically stems into everything that you guys said, like it's industry specific, and there's not just one one model to rule it all. There's there's a lot of you know small little nuances throughout everything, and especially when it comes to the different industries out there. And not not to flavor a point, but when you use your whiplash example, how much of your training data already has misclassified fraud writ fraud as like <laughs> You could be training it to accept fraud. It's just a super, super hard right. problem. Wow. That's the yeah. terrifying thing, training it to accept fraud. <laughs> but that's a, that's a really good point, Aaron. It goes back to like the quality of data. And I think just like understanding if the fraud label data is of good quality is super hard. Uh, majority of the times it could be um, false flags uh, or it could be like manually deciding that like within companies that this is we believe this is fraud um. yeah to actually this this is a great point that we haven't talked about and we definitely should talk more about which is the the guts of these systems are you know labeling and observability of the decisions you make and yeah. without either of those things you could have the most sophisticated algorithm on this planet and you're just not going to have a good time with it. Um, all fraud systems require a process to determine this was fraud and you have to hold that to a high bar and continuously improve and iterate on it. And in fact, that's more of a process problem and not a technology problem. We're here to talk about tech, but tech is like super powered by good processes. And then the right. second is, how do you feed those labels back into the decisions you're making to determine how to make better decisions? And that's like a, actually a very hard problem and one that a lot of places underinvest in. It's fun to ship models. It's fun to make faster decisions and have like pay less OPEX for people to make decisions. It's hard to make like a robust automated platform that you can have good observability on and you can iterate on over time. Um, yeah, that's, that's slightly a buzzkill on AI for everything, but it's like an important context that 90% of AI's superpower is having these sort of building blocks in mm -hmm. place to launch them effectively. Yeah, I don't think it's a buzzkill. I think it's a reality check <laughs> realistically, right? Um, yeah, yeah. So Cool. Well, uh, I got another question here that uh, kind of revolves around the privacy uh, issues or question discussion that we were having. It comes from Mohammed Sohail Khan. Uh, how do we deploy uh, anonymization solutions in order to address the privacy aspect of personally identifying information or PII while working on sensitive data? Um. I think one really straightforward solution to this is um, once we have the PII data of our customers, it makes sense to essentially have give the give the access of this data to a very small set of people, but rather essentially create these uh, massive aggregations over the data. So essentially, the data that you send to your machine learning algorithms to actually train on. Uh, if someone had to see a single record of it, you pretty much would not be able to identify the customer at all. Uh, so the idea is that you 
do some form of really heavy processing. You aggregate the data, you anonymize it uh, massively even before it goes. So the data science practitioners, they are able to make uh, the most of it, but uh, they basically don't see the PII. So it also removes the factor of, uh, uh, of someone misusing the data or uh, taking any undue advantage of it. Yeah, I think oh, one other one other thing you'll have to confront is you really need scale for anonymization um, and mm -hmm. machine learning to work together. Um, you need to have enough data so that you can anonymize effectively, uh, i.e. you cannot back out what that specific row of data is. Um, and then with that, you need to be able to, uh, yeah, put that into your, to your ML model. So anonymization is something that's being explored quite heavily, um, but it's you'll notice it's being explored by the biggest players. And there are third party companies out there trying to create marketplaces for this. And their goal is aggregation, mm -hmm. i.e. get enough scale um, to implement anonymization. It's not necessarily so much about technique. There's a lot of different anonymization techniques out there. It's about collecting enough scale for any of those solutions to actually provide like a level of security uh, that you uh, would hope you can achieve with these systems. Yeah, I've seen I've seen the third parties out there that are anonymizing data sets and things, especially for very data sensitive uh, machine learning projects and things of that nature. Yeah, so it's it's there. There's a sub industry that's actually kind of bubbling up right now because of because of everything that AI is, is kind of having its hands in, for sure. All right, so, um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so Junaid came in with a question, uh, wondering if there's any AI tool to detect asset management and investment fraud that you guys are aware of. Nothing that's kind of coming up. <laughs> okay, so sorry, Janaid. Um, nothing, nothing coming up to the books right now. Um, let's see what other questions we have here on the books. Um, Demetrius comes in with a question in regards to authorizing authorization rates. Like, how can uh, what applications of AI could be used to optimize payment authorization rates and monitoring payment performance? Have you guys run into that before? Um, I would say all the time, um, but not necessarily used. A, I've, okay, so to any like broad, um, wherever like we are doing fraud detection or credit type of detection uh, or credit assessment, uh, those usually, like those teams usually also have these contra models. So they would basically try to determine if the, uh, um, the customer is good uh, rather than deciding the riskiness of the customer. Um, so it's a very similar type of, I mean, way of thinking about a model but just looking at different types of inputs that would identify and like say that hey this this customer is good we see really good behavior and that way you can increase the conversion parts so it's balancing the risk by saying hey these we believe are 100 percent good so so even though a model might falsely say it might be risky the the good is basically uh, higher than the the bad uh, risk indicators Gotcha. Okay. Um, anybody else want to chime in? Or is that, I think that's pretty, uh, a pretty good answer there. So uh, Ahmed came in. Uh, do you think having a, or do you think AI having its benefits in fintech and fraud detection can also have a negative effect on fintech or any other field? It definitely does on the end. Go, going back to the earlier question, like, uh, 
at least for a company like Klarna, like uh, these uh, the, the broad uh, risk models that we have or any broad related uh, uh, policies, rules that we have, like they're uh, severely could be impacting our uh, conversion of, uh, of uh, purchases. Um, so it's, it's always about uh, finding the best models and the most optimal models. Um, but, and, and by doing so, like we have to basically have quality data uh, to understand what is false positive and what is actual fraud. Um, mm -hmm. one, one other thing that was mentioned a little earlier that, you know, a lot of the big um, LLM models we've seen have used reinforcement learning um, and those types of techniques, which is which is relatively new, at least for wide scale adoption and application. Reinforcement learning has been around for a long time, but the ability for agents to be adaptive and to learn quickly over time um, will be probably a sea change in terms of fraudulent events. Um, I think we talked about machines fighting machines, but we're starting to now see large scale adoption and usage of some of the techniques that allow them to kind of learn from new strategies faster. And for those in the audience, you know, reinforcement learning is, is really, it's, it's kind of fully mm -hmm. non-parametric. It's you, you try some things, you get some rewards and you do the things that give you higher rewards over time. So it's adaptive in a way that uh, traditional ML models uh, are not. Um, and uh, uh, these techniques have been around for a while, but we haven't seen them as popularized. Um, and there's now a lot more building going on with these agents. There's a lot more tooling that will make it easier for a person to kind of unleash an agent that has like an RL system embedded in it out to the wild. Um, and at the end of the day, if the tool exists, then it'll get used. Um, so yeah, that, that I think will be a, a big problem. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Learning the, yeah, that is very interesting. Uh, I think we got time for one more, uh, for a deal. Um, um, how can, how AI, how can AI be used to detect new and evolving forms of financial fraud, such as crypto, uh, related scams? Any thoughts so, around that? Yeah. One thing with crypto scams is uh, the velocity that uh, the scam happens with. And essentially most of these scams does usually make um, small chunks of payments with a really fast velocity. And they have victims or sometimes even mules paying in really fast. And I think here is where anomaly detection sort of kicks in um, and then there, there are different things that you can use for anomaly detections. Um, I think one of the things you can use is even auto encoders, probably. Uh, so it's basically to see how anomalous is the customer's behavior in conjunction to uh, the other good customers within a segment and whether that behavior actually makes sense. I think if you put the behavior together, it would be easy to spot things like crypto scam. Behavior detection and behavior modeling type of yeah. type of approach, right? Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Does anybody have anything to add on top of that? All right. Cool. Well, like I said, that was we had enough time for one more question. I, I think these are all great questions, but uh, more importantly, I'm I'm actually very. Um, confident in the in the aspects of how we're using ai to help with with uh you know fraudulent activities and and uh, how ai is actually impacting you know fintech um i think you know what i'm what i'm pulling away from this whole entire discussion is obviously it's just, it's not a one model to fit all it's not going to be one solution to fit every single type of fintech and every sim a single type of industry and every single type of interaction um that that uh that people have right 
but then also pulling it back on like it's 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 pulling it to the root aspect of of AI, which is quality data, right? Getting structured quality data, make sure it's labeled properly, make sure you have enough volume to be able to build your model and train your model on it, but also have that ability to not be biased when building the model and training the model. So there's a lot of human aspects to it to build the the AI to to help um uh to help move it forward right so you know my humble opinion uh i don't think ai is going to completely replace everybody in the fintech or fraud detection arena there's no way right so um I, you are at the end of the day you are going to have machines fighting machines but behind those machines you're going to have people understanding what that actually means and enhancing them so um i really enjoyed this conversation i, I did take away a lot of really good good insights myself. I hope everybody on this call did as well. Um, there are little things that I'm slightly terrified about, but I think we'll get it all taken care of as well about machines learning how machines learn. And then, it, you know, self, self-sufficient, uh, the, the, uh, the bad side of the fraud side of things, but I think you guys are one step or two steps ahead of that. So, um, super excited. And Aaron, Mohammed, Ryan, Abdila, uh, uh, sorry, Adiva, I appreciate it. Uh, had a really good discussion with you guys and uh, appreciate this talk. Thank, thank you, Bryce. You. All right. Thank you, thank you everybody.